Hello, and welcome to the Visible Women Podcast. I'm Kim DeBrew, and along with my co-host, Corinne Corbett, we put issues related to diversity, inclusion, and appearance in the spotlight and examine how they impact the lives of women of color. Today, we're going to revisit the sizes and discussion we had a few weeks ago. But this time, we're going to focus on the quote-unquote plus-size market and its place in the fashion industry. I've spent most of my career in the media industry, which puts, which puts quite a bit of focus on one's look. The ideal is always a tall, perfect size two or smaller, but who really fits that bill? Not most women in the world. I know you'll agree to that. And although men invented that standard, there are so many women who enforce it knowing full well that it leaves out a large portion of women of color. But even when it comes to breakthrough plus size moments in pop culture, doesn't it seem that the accomplishments of women of color are also diminished? Rebel Wilson was the most recent person to do just that when she proclaimed herself the first plus sized actress to star in a romantic comedy. She said it though, she claims to be the first plus size actress, or she claimed to be the first plus size actress to star in a romantic comedy. She even stood her ground when black and brown women told her on Twitter that she comes after Monique and Queen Latifah. And frankly, she comes after Ricky Lake as well. But you probably already knew that Rebel didn't take that well because she blocked those same black and brown women on Twitter because they dared to correct her. We can probably all agree that we're not lining up to see Rebel Wilson's movie, that romantic comedy she's talking about. Even though she did come on that apologies tour, you know, I'm sorry if I offended anybody, but you know that one. Well, she did that too, but we'll pass. But as excited as we can be about actress like Chrissy Metz getting her break on This Is Us, it would be quite difficult to name a black or brown woman of a similar size who regularly appears on the big or small screen in such a prominent role. The the new show Dietland that struck me as, as, as fascinating for a number of reasons. First, Joy Ness's character Plum is literally giving her voice to somebody else. So she's like peak invisibility in that way. She's lending her voice to to the editor-in-chief, her voice and her thoughts to the editor-in-chief as the ghostwriter for Daisy Chains, letter to the editor. But also, Plum is searching for a way out of her current situation. She's a plus-size woman that does not want to be plus-size any longer. So she goes to meetings called Waste Watchers. And in the first episode, she encounters... Another, another plus size woman who comes in mid-meeting and she's asked to explain Waste Watchers philosophy. And she says, people don't come to Waste Watchers because they feel good about themselves. It's because they're ready to feel good about themselves. So they're perpetually ladies in waiting or people in waiting. But Janice, who was the other woman who came in, countered that and said, I'm a unicorn, I'm a goddess, and I I get more men than the rest of you. I'm paraphrasing there because she said something else. But the most interesting, maybe because I'm a a former beauty editor, the most interesting part of that first episode was Plum's visit to the beauty closet, which was was was, was the change agent in the basement. Tamara Tooney, the only black face I saw, well, no, she wasn't the only black face, but she was the driver of change in this episode. And she said something that really stuck with me. When she was talking to Plum, she said, we are all part of the dissatisfaction industrial complex machine. They get us to pay them to tell us how broken we are, and then we pay for the products to fix them. 
forgive my detour into pop culture because that's not what really why we're here today. But it does have a direct influence on what we see in fashion because there's a lyrist cross and before that, an Angelica Morton for every Ashley Graham. When it comes to clothing, the inequality persists despite the body positive revolution. While Universal Standard is making great strides in this, in this space, in the inclusivity space, with their bold advertising, they show women or their customer in all of her various pla- points of beauty. And that can be applauded. But everybody is not on that train, obviously. There are also, on the opposite end, op-eds like the one that appeared in Business of Fashion this summer that said that the plus size fashion business will ultimately fail. Why? Because women ultimately all want to be thin and that will continue to be the driver of the fashion industry. Hmm. I don't even know what to say to that because that is so off base. Well, instead of focusing on the industry from a business perspective, we thought it might be a fantastic idea to give you an insider's view. And I'm delighted to welcome Rosalie Jimenez to the show, who has more than 20 years experience as a photo director, but she's also the daughter of Dominican immigrants. So her experience at fashion magazines is unique, to say the least. We first met at Mode Magazine 20 years ago. And for, the, for those of you who don't already know, Mode was one of the first magazines, the, one of the first fashion magazines to focus on real size women. Since then, Rosalie has seen the good, the bad, and the ugly from the inside as a photo director. We'll also hear about her journey and learn how she's taken back her power through style and now empowers others as the photo and fashion director of Dia and Company. Welcome, Rosalie. Thank you for having me so much, Corinne. I'm so excited. Thank you so much, Kim. So Rosalie, how did you come to work at Mode? I had just graduated from college and I got my first job at Condé Nast. Uh, and for those of, uh, who are listening who don't know Condé Nast, Condé Nast is the publisher of Vogue. So it's really where the devil wears Prada. And it was a very difficult place to work at. And I just remember seeing Mode on the newsstand. And I could not believe that there was something there that was for size, women's the beyond a size 12. Uh, so I remember reading it, and I fell in love with it. So while I was working at Kanye Naz, I actually just wrote a letter to uh, Bill Swan, who uh, was the photo director there and became my boss eventually. Uh, and it turns out that there was an available position. So really, I feel like it was meant to be. It wasn't for a very long time, but one thing that did happen, which I, I'll talk about a little bit later, was it's had an immense impact on how I view plus size women, plus size fashion, and myself as a plus size woman. Uh, and having seen that quote unquote trend happen 20 years ago and ha- seen the resurgence of it, my hope is that it's not just a trend for marketing, that there really is going to be a permanent change and we'll all see each other as equal no matter what our size is. So when you think about our topic, Rosalie's, what size got to do with it? And you think about your own personal journey uh, to this moment in time, what would, you, what would you say about what mattered in your journey? I mean, I was very fortunate. I'm not going to pretend that my size didn't um, cause people to treat me a certain way or perceive me a certain way, I should say. But I think one of the things and it's, it's horrible to say that worked to my advantage is that I am a light-skinned Dominican. And everyone would, quote, unquote, always tell me that I was well-spoken. So I think that is what, why I ended up at Condé Nast. Condé Nast, for example, and not to just single them out, all of publishing at that time was a space where it was really only wealthy young girls got to work there. Because you got paid minimum wage, but you were living in New York City. And I just... I mean, I was just very fortunate to have the experience, but also the fact that I wasn't what they thought a Dominican girl was, I think is what kind of unfortunately helped me. People would always say to me, oh, I bet you wear red lipstick and hoop earrings all the time. So for a long time, I didn't wear red lipstick and didn't wear earrings. 
because that was their perception of what a Dominican or Puerto Rican or Latina woman from New York City was, or is, still is. So tell me a little bit about, so after Mode, and you went back to you know, general market magazines. Yes. Tell me how that changed, you know, just your viewpoint. Well, first of all, working with you, you were the first woman of color who was in a position of power that I had ever worked with. So I had never seen that before. Uh, I had never experienced that before. Also, I've never been surrounded by plus size women who are fashionable and loved fashion. Um, I think about some of the editors there, like Nicole, and when we were doing casting into models. So after that point, I saw that there was possibility for a woman my size to have fun with fashion. So once we, once I left and I went on to back to Kanye Nast, then to Time Inc., I was always asking, well, can we include plus size? Can we include, when I was at Mode, we used to do this. Um, so it actually helped me become, without me even realizing, an advocate for plus size women, and because I knew that the possibility was there. They just were too lazy to do it. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, and they just weren't interested. They just honestly weren't interested in serving us as a community, not interested at all. Uh, and just the same way that many people who are always say, oh, I'm not racist, tend to be the most racist people ever. A lot of people they are like, oh, all body shapes are beautiful, or you, you know, you can wear this. They have no clue, no idea that they are prejudiced against people of certain sizes. So it sounds like you got your sea legs and you were able to ask more powerful questions in new environments. Would you say that you were able to kind of push the needle a little bit more in terms of perception about fashion and beauty for, uh, for plus size women? Were you able to kind of get any traction? Well, I think for myself, just being an example, I was always on set with celebrities, always on set with these models and amazing fashion directors, and just them seeing me and getting to experience a plus size woman, uh, an ethnic plus size woman, uh, I think was, uh, was eye opening to them. But then also once I, at my last magazine job at People Style Watch, when they started a plus size column, the fashion director who I previously worked with at Cardi Nets, she would ask my opinion, like, what would you think of this? Uh, what do you think of this outfit? And I would say to her, you know, if that came in straight size, would we tell our readers to wear it? And she said, no. And like, I would uh, kind of challenge her a little bit and, and just say, you know, we're often kind of having to settle for what's just available and no one's taking the time to give us something fabulous. Um, so I think when I was there, that was really an opportunity for me to help move that along. And then even though I'm not a writer, I started writing for the blog, Plus Size Fashion, and also on people.com. I wrote about plus size fashion because for a long time, I was the only plus size editor there. 20 years ago, Mode, you know, kind of like was, was revolutionizing fashion and then it went away. So now the, the I think this is different, the, the, the body positive movement and the way that plus size bloggers have been able to hold space because there are, you know, there are many voices and many different styles. Tell us about, um, so you said you're not a writer, but you are now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you are now. Tell us about how you see the movement growing and changing. Well, I mean, I think that social media is really the, the an amazing can be can be an amazing platform for people to celebrate themselves and to see and meet other people like themselves. I think one thing, as much as I always consider myself a magazine editor, it was always one sided. It was always metrics. You know, you wouldn't put the black girl on the cover except for the October and February issue because they were historically the uh, the worst selling issues ever. So that's when they would take a chance. Uh, and I will never forget when I heard that in a meeting, that blew my mind. So now just seeing the change and seeing all the voices that are on social media, sometimes I think there's too many voices, but really seeing people just championing for each other. I'm hoping that this time around, it's not a fad and that it's really going to kind of just change the way people perceive themselves, first of all, 
and perceive other people. That is my hope. Whether or not it's going to happen or how long it's going to take, I'm not quite sure. But that's where my, my hope is that that's the direction that it's going to go, where being plus size is not going to be a disability, seen as a disability. So if we if we have some catalyzers in our, in our audience that are listening who want to kind of escalate change, want to jump in to move the ball forward qu more quickly, what counsel or advice would you give them in terms of getting involved? Well, I think speaking up and just not accepting what's just being handed to you, really speaking up for what you want. Um, I think we as plus women have been taught to settle. I know even for myself as a Latina, I was kind of taught to settle. Like, you know, people are always going to think this about you, so just accept it. Uh, but no, we don't have to. Uh, just using our voice, but also a much bigger solution, I think, is going to be changing the education system. Right now, students aren't really being taught in fashion, the fashion industry. They're not being taught how to design for bigger women. Um, so when we do have larger sizes or when a, a brand like, let's say, my Coors has larger sizes, it's not really giving the same care and attention that the street sizes are. Because also, a lot of people are just not, a lot of people designing it are not plus size. They're not going to even understand, like, what chub rub is. And that certain fabrics are going to make you sweat more. Um, I think it really, we have to change the education system uh, in order to have a long-lasting effect. So you're, you're now at DA and Company. Tell us how you think the very existence of this company empowers women to be visible. Well, it's really amazing to be able to interact with the customers. So many of them uh, have written in that they haven't, they haven't worn a dress in 20 years. So they'll get one in their subscription box and they'll try it and they'll feel fantastic. And just empowering women through, through style and fashion. What's interesting is that oftentimes we think of fashion and style as being something frivolous, but actually it can be a powerful tool. Nothing feels at least nothing makes me feel more powerful than a pair of heels and an amazing red lipstick. And there's something so powerful in being able to celebrate yourself through style. When I was going through my own transformation, I used fashion, I used style. I um, had been diagnosed with cancer in my late thirties. And as I was recovering and my body was healing itself, I was like, you know what? Life is amazing. I'm going to wear like, an amazing printed dress, which I never used to do. So just the existence of a company like this, it's an opportunity for women to reach out, ask for help if they are intimidated by style and fashion, and also to be given the opportunity to try something. They don't even have to buy it. Just try it. You've never worn skinny jeans? Just here's a great pair of skinny jeans. Just try it. Now, for our listeners who are not familiar with Tia and Company, tell us a little bit about the company. So it's an amazing company. It's been around for four years. Uh, it's a styling service for plus size women. So for women size 14 and up, uh, many of our styles come up to size 30, go up to size 32. Uh, so it's a place where they can come, they fill out a survey, talk about what kind of uh, pieces they might want to add to their wardrobe, if they need more workwear, or if they want just nice casual pieces, or they're looking for a great pair of jeans. So we have a stylist who will curate a box according to their needs and their likes, and then we send it to them. Um, and it's really to see them tag me in photos or tag the company, and for them to talk about how empowered they feel. One woman in particular, she was a cancer survivor. She didn't want to show off her belly. I made her try on a bodycon dress, and she wrote an article about it because she couldn't believe how fabulous she felt. So really there's a lot of power in style and fashion because it is a way for us to be visible and not invisible. So many years I wore black fit and flare dresses for Ann Taylor with a bun and black ballet flats because I didn't want to stand out, didn't want anybody to see me. I didn't want them to see the fat girl, the fat Dominican girl whose father grew up with an outhouse. I didn't want them to see it. But now I want to be seen and I want to be heard. And I want to help women give them that opportunity to be seen 
and to know that they are worth being seen and that they are not invisible. That's amazing, Rosalie. And I think that what you're doing and what companies like the Ann Company do is, as you said, make, because we're talking about sizeism and make, made to feel invisible, we put on these wardrobes that are like almost like armor yes. that, you know, protect us from the outside and don't cause any waves and do these things. But to, to have options to be bold if you want to be, to be sexy if you want to be, to be playful, to be trendy. These are things that were not available. And at a time where it's lo lovely that J. Crew and Universal Standard are doing their thing, but at the same time, you have like places like Saks that you know don't have Salon Z anymore in the store. So it, it, that's another way that people become invisible. You have the money to spend on luxury items and don't have a place to go try them on in a store. That, that sends a signal to, to them. But at the same time, you're sending a signal that this is an opportunity for us to service you personally. Absolutely. And your, and, and your needs and to, to make you find joy in who you are right now. That's what the opposite of what Diet Land was saying in that first episode, find joy in who you are now. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, if you have to love yourself the way you are now because I can guarantee 20 years from now, you're going to look at a photo of yourself and say, why did I think I was fat? Why did I think I was ugly? And sometimes when I get to, into that space and that mode where I feel not so great about myself, I think to myself, okay, what would 64-year-old me say right now to me right now? And then that kind of snaps me back into place. It's all about perception. And what really matters is how we perceive ourselves because people are going to see that energy. They're going to feel the energy. Whether you think that you're invisible or not, they're going to feel that energy. And if you're giving off the energy of like, don't look at me, I'm invisible, you're better than I am. You went to Harvard, I, I went to City College. Like, they're going to treat you that way. A lot of people are going to treat you that way no matter what. When I tell people that I went to a prep school, they're like, you did? Um, you know, they act surprised. Like, how is that possible? Like, you know what? What matters is how I carry myself in the world, how I move through the world. And I'm going to take space and I want to be seen. I want to be heard. 20 years ago, I never would have sat in front of right here, this computer, talking to anybody about this. I would have been so ashamed, so embarrassed. 20 years ago, I never would have stood in front of an audience to speak about my experiences with uh, cancer and how it, it transformed my life and how style and fashion transformed my life. I never would have done that. I was always told to be quiet, to work harder than everybody else, um, and to silence myself. But now I'm like, no, no thank you. No thank you. Um, I'm here, I'm part of this world, and there's a reason why I'm here. And part of it is also to share my story. I didn't struggle and have almost five organs removed from 2011 to 2015 to just sit here and be quiet. I, am, I want to be part of a revolution, and even if it's just uh, revolutionizing the way five people think about themselves, that's, that is magic. I'm here to be of service to people, to be of service to women, to be of service to especially women of color, because we were taught at a young age that you have to be invisible to be liked, to be accepted by white society, um, and that's really not the case. Correct. We would we often are told to, you know, tone it down. And yep. especially when you work at a general market magazine, don't bring your whole self to work or don't bring in those, in those places. But when we do, we teach, we teach some valuable lessons. Yes. And that's what we, that's what we learn that um, bringing the parts of ourselves that, that may seem foreign to uh, the privileged set that work in a lot of those environments, actually is is a benefit and we've got to look at it that way absolutely and the way and and to understand and to be proud of the fact that we come from communities where it may not necessarily be about money but style still exists no matter what oh my goodness like that's my mom is a hairdresser um just growing up she's never been plus size but still growing up she always wore her lipstick i've never seen her in sneakers in my whole life She's 69 years old, never seen her in sneakers. 
style was always so important. We like going to the salon was like getting my hair set in rollers was like going to church. That might as well just be communion. Um, it was about a way of also self care. And it was a ritual, like getting my hair washed and set every Sunday was a ritual. And it was just a way of expressing myself. And that's so important in our community. Um, and style is something that I think a lot of, of our family members always knew was something so powerful. Uh, and I'm so grateful that I inherit that, inherited that from my mother and my grandmother. So one, I wanna just say that we are so happy to partner with you in this revolutionary space you. that you are fully occupying. We're grateful, grateful that you have kind of taken up the mantle to move the issues forward for plus size women and share messages that style is available to all of us. I, um, I'm a leadership coach by training and I spend a lot of time trying to help individuals really break out of patterns of mind, you know, habits of mind that kind of hold you back. And one of the things that I heard you say that was so powerful is that you can start somewhere. That that styling box, that consultation that you're providing is a start. So you've never thought about this. How about that? And I, I would love to hear you comment on kind of the power that you've heard just about those those initial starts. I never thought that I could. And the power in that conversation, how it transforms lives in your in your current work. I'd love to hear an example or two that would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, it's really um, amazing. Like I mentioned, there's some women who have never worn a dress and they'll get a dress and they start to feel powerful. There are women who have gotten several boxes and when they first got their boxes, they just wore like leggings and t-shirts and didn't even want to try anything. Um, didn't, they had given, I don't want to say they'd given up, but they had lost hope. I think one interesting thing to point out is a lot of these women weren't always plus size. So maybe there was a time when they were much thinner and they just, after children or whatever, a lot of them had a, uh, their body changed and they didn't know who they were anymore. Um, I think style is such an important part of our identity. So we help them rediscover to some extent their identity. There was a woman that I met and she came into the office. She was crying. She was so excited and she wanted to go to a concert and look cute. And I made her try on an off the shoulder top and she thought she could never wear one. She thought she was too old. She's like, I'm 42. And I'm like, girl, I'm 44. Just put it on. And she tagged me in a photo. She was just at a concert a couple of weeks ago and she was feeling fantastic and she was savoring the moment and enjoying the moment and really just being fully present in the moment. And I think there's so many times when I know I they used to be times I didn't go to the beach because I didn't want people to see me in a bathing suit. So I missed out on opportunities, but we're helping women not miss out on those opportunities because they don't know what to wear because we're also helping them figure out this is this top will look great with this bottom. So we also include a note, a recipe, if you will, of how to put the looks together. So it's really been for me empowering to, they've inspired me because I'm still human. So there are some times when I wake up in the morning and I'm like, where did I get that line from? I didn't have that yesterday. Or this looks a little saggy. Or like, what happened to my boobs? They used to be like a little perkier. Um, so we all have those moments. And we're human. We're going to have those moments, I think, until the, the day we die. But it's about accepting who you are and celebrating who you are right now, this second. It doesn't matter what the scale says. It doesn't matter what the size tag in your jeans says. That does not equate to the value of who you are as a human. The same way that your bank account doesn't, that's really not, uh, doesn't, what you have, that's not your value. That's not your worth. That's not your worth. Your real worth comes from how you feel about yourself. That's really what worth is. Everything else is just a physical manifestation of what, as humans, we think is of value. Um, but your worth comes in how you choose to express yourself. And you, I'm not saying go out there and wear like a sequin jumpsuit and start like screaming out in, with a megaphone how much you love yourself. 
but just take a moment, take five minutes, put on a, a, a lipstick, just try something, put on a cute pair of shoes. You're worth it. And you don't have to spend a lot of money also in order to express yourself through style. Rosalie, you have really blessed us with your presence today. No, I feel blessed because also this is also a reminder for myself. Um, even though I've been practicing this, sometimes we need to remind ourselves. So this has been an amazing opportunity. So I thank both of you so much. Corinne, I, I, know I sent you a message about a year ago about this, but um, you were the first woman in a, in a top position that I ever met that was like me. You know, I'll never forget when you told me when you, how you grew up in Clinton Hill. Um, and I, you know, I did not grow up in Brooklyn, but growing up in Queens and growing up in the boroughs, growing, being a native New Yorker is, um, and a woman of color is such a unique experience. Um, and it was the first time that I saw the possibility of what I could do in the world. So thank you for that. Wow, I've had, I've had the pleasure of, you know, working with great teams and you are among them and I'm so grateful that we had that opportunity. Thank you, Bill Form. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> and, you. And if women are interested in finding out more about Dia and company, can you just give us a little bit of give us some details about how to um, get a box and how it works? Yes, definitely. So you just go to dia.com, D I A dot com. There is a survey. You fill out the survey. Uh, there's a twenty dollars styling fee, and that fee goes towards your purchase. And from there, you'll be paired up with an amazing stylist. We have a great team of people that are specifically trained to style plus size bodies, um, and they'll send you a box, and then you're gonna open it up and see magic. Magic, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank um, you so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, and for just bringing home the message that. You know, style is a vehicle mm -hmm. to make yourself visible. Yes. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a vehicle. Don't, just like I don't look at beauty as lipstick or whatever. It's, those are nice accoutrements, okay. but it is that, that, that beauty and style are catalysts for so much more than we give them credit for. So thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you so much, Cam. Thank you so much to the two of you. That's our show for today. Look for the latest installment of the Visible Women podcast every other Wednesday, where we'll tackle issues and experiences that relate to appearance, diversity, and inclusion that are relevant to your life. Check out our website, visiblewomenpodcast.com, where you can find out more about the episode and follow us on our social channels. Make sure you join our Facebook group to participate in discussions about our latest episode. Until then, here's to all the visible women out there. Never forget that we see you.